everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, we meet here on Zoom to connect, inspire, and create with the help of a guest speaker that shares their images, stories of inspiration, and their tips to help you improve your photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. And if you are in the Central Texas area, take a look at the event that is listed for Saturday, March 19th, because the Happiness Hour will be an in-person, all-day event at the Georgetown, Texas Photography Festival. Elise Bender, Valerie Hoffman, Jama Pantel, Karen Riley, Rob Doyle, and Andrew Vaughn will share their passion for photography with interesting and varied topics, so I hope that you can join us in person. In case you missed any of our previous sessions, you can find links that, to them under Happiness Hour, and that link will take you to, to my YouTube channel. So tonight's guest is Katie Waddington. Katie is a wildlife photographer who's joining us from the United Kingdom this evening. Katie strides to take something most people consider mundane and bring out its intricate patterns that escapes the naked eye. In tonight's presentation, rediscovering your local wildlife with the Meet Your Neighbors photography technique. You guys can see more of Katie's work on Instagram at Katie Waddington Photography. That's Katie underscore Waddington underscore photography and on her website at katiewaddingtonphotography.com. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Katie. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited that you're here and I know, okay, for first of all, we're just going to, we're just going to put it out there, Katie. This is your first presentation ever, 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 ever. And so Katie yeah. and I were visiting a couple of days ago and um, she kind of confessed that, you know, one day she hopes to be teaching her own workshops. And I told her this is a perfect place for her to come and just, you know, kind of, get her feet wet with maybe teaching and, and doing a, a presentation for this group. So with that, I'm going to hand over the microphone to you and, and let you take over the screen. But, um, but first, tell us a little bit about how you got started in photography. Yeah, um, so I'm born and raised in the southwest of France, um, just north of Toulouse. Um, and at a very young age, I'd um, be really interested in my natural surroundings. And just like any photographer, really, I started taking my mum's camera out and about. Um, and that actually led to me doing studies um, in Toulouse, so photography studies. But that was more portrait based. And I always knew I wanted to focus on wildlife. And when I looked around at courses that were in France, there weren't any available to me. So I moved to England, um, to the southwest of England in Cornwall, and I studied marine and natural history photography um, at Falmouth University. And whilst I was there, I was able to try um, a lot of specialist equipment. So that was the first time I actually used um, a macro lens. And then I dabbled a bit in microscopy. And I must have done something right because my, some of my images were exhibited at the G7 down in Cornwall. Uh, I've also been a finalist in the Close-Up Photographer of the Year. Uh, and I've had some of my work exhibited at the Tate, which is a prestigious gallery here in England. Um, I'm also a Girls Who Click ambassador. So that's an organization where we uh, empower other women in photography uh, through a mentorship scheme. And that's actually how I know um, Elise Bender, who's been here before, because she's my mentor and she helps me um, create images um, that are great for telling conservation stories. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to have you. And yes, I wonder, um, Elise and I were uh, on our way to, do, to a shoot 
And um, she's like, I got to take this call. I've got to, I got to do a real quick call. And I'm pretty sure it was with you because she says, you know, cause it was an odd time for, you know, you to be awake and it'd be, you know, it was a decent hour. So I'm pretty sure it was you. I need to come back and circle around and ask her, was it, was it Katie? But um, I'm happy to have you. And thank you for sharing a little bit about yourself. Cause it is hard. It's hard to come down on in front of strangers and say, this is who I am and this is what I do. And, you know, um, um, uh, the group here is really wonderful and welcoming. So I'm happy to have you. So with that, if you're ready to start, let's let's get going. Just so you know, all the images you're going to see in this presentation were taken over two years um, in the southwest of France in my family's garden or the nearby meadow. So we're here to talk about rediscovering your local wildlife with the Meet Your Neighbors Tech photograph, photography technique, sorry. Um, so this is me. Um, this image was taken uh, at St. Michael's Mount in England. Um, I was taking pictures of a cormorant and my friends called me and they said, hey, Katie, you might want to casually, you know, start making your way back. You know, the tide's coming in, but, it's, you know, it's nothing too bad. So I started heading back and by the time I got there, um, the tide had come in and it was even at knee level. Um, so that's, I guess, one of my first experiences with um, checking the tide. Um, for anyone interested, there's my website and my Instagram. And um, please feel free to reach out to me at the end of this and um, show me some of your photography and anything else. This is, I guess, kind of my turning point in photography. So this is when I realized that I could create um, kind of meaningful images or at least ones that um, made me feel a certain way about insects um, and you know I was a teenager I took my mum's camera and ever since then I've been striving to create images that raise awareness for um, insects because they're you know really important pollinators um, without them our crops um, could be devastated but also um, a lot of people forget their vital food source um, for predators. So they're crucial in the food chain. And I like creating images that remind people of that and just show their importance. I'm also um, just interested in general, um, at anything I can come across. It's always um, quite exciting when you discover a new animal in your nearby environment. So this was um, a koi pea I came across, which in American is Nutria. Um, and I found him down in France near a lake. And I made a little film on it called Meet the Koi Poos. And I just thought it was interesting. It's not something you see every day for, for me in any case, because they're not around in England anymore. So, you know, just to show you a bit of the other work I do. And then I wanted to show you this one because this is uh, one of the images that was shown at the G7. And it's a uh, blue bottles fly eye under the microscope. And it's made up of uh, 52 different photographs that are photo stacked together to create one vibrant um, photograph that shows the intricate details that can be found on insects. So that was a bit more about me, so you could see everything I do. Uh, and now to talk about what is the Meet Your Neighbours technique. So the Meet Your Neighbours technique is an international movement um, where photographers celebrate the beauty of their local wildlife. Uh, it was created and founded by uh, Clay Bolt and Neil Benvey. And I've actually had the pleasure of talking to Clay Bolt once and showing him my images and getting his advice on how to best photograph the Meet Your Neighbors movement. Um, so this is, uh, this European wasp is an example. And you're probably guessing that by now when I talk about Meet Your Neighbors, I'm not talking about your human neighbors, I'm actually talking about the wildlife that surrounds you. Um, the idea is to photograph an animal or a plant uh, on the white background so that there are no distractions and that subject becomes the center of attention. It's also a non-invasive way of photographing animals because instead of capturing 
um, like this insect and taking it indoors to a foreign environment, you're actually um, taking a portable studio to, for example, the wasp. And there are a few ways you can actually do this. One of the ways is you can um, gently <laughs> encourage um, this common toad, for example, onto your white background. So the white background I use is um, a white sheet of perspex. Um, but what you want to do is always have a priority is the well-being of the animal. So when I do have him on the background, um, I'll keep the background close to the ground so that if the toad does decide to jump off, it won't harm itself in the process. And then um, I don't keep him for long. And because I haven't actually um, gone indoors and changed the location, it's very easy to then place him back where I found him. On the other hand, you can use this technique with um, like this forester moth who is just resting on the plant. So there's no need to disturb it. And what you'll want to do is take your white piece of perspex and carefully and slowly <laughs> sneak up on the insect and place it behind it. So the usual setup is you want to be in front of your camera, you set up a tripod with a light that's shining on um, your subject, and then you're gonna place a white background behind, and behind your white background, you're gonna want to flash also. So those are the essentials, and don't worry, I'm gonna go over that again. But the main thing to keep in mind is that we are keeping um, the animal stress level to a minimum. And that's what's really important um, with using this technique. So that leads me to what kit do you need? I'd say make it your own. Take the advice I'm going to give you and adapt it to a setup that works best for you. I'm going to give you, in a sense, the essential kit you're going to need. But then, you know, there are no rules on how best you should set it up. So you're going to need a camera. I personally use a Nikon D750. A macro lens, I use um, Nikon 105 millimeters, and that's a one for one ratio. And what that means is that um, I'm photographing at the same um, size as what I'm seeing. A white sheet of perspex, so that is your background, that is essential. Um, two flashes with a receiver, because every time you take an image, um, you want your flash to go off at the same time as you're taking the image. And then a diffuser, so it's important to have a diffuser on the flash that's in front of the subject, so that the um, light isn't too harsh on it. You're then going to want a tripod. As I mentioned before, that tripod is for the flash that you're positioning um, in front of the subject. Um, I personally use a Manfrotto V3 because I like how light it is. And I like that I can make um, the legs quite low down, which is great when you're working with um, insects that are just like on a strand of grass. And then I put an assistant or a plamp. Now, a plamp is the object, the bendy object you can see in the image. You can twist it round and it's got two clamps on either side. So if you want to um, work alone, you can set up a second tripod behind the subject. You will put um, the plamp on the tripod and then put it upwards so that you're holding the background. So that tripod will have a flash. You'll have your background held up. You have your subject. And then you have your other tripod that has the flash on it pointed towards the subject and you're in front of it. The only reason I don't use that setup as much is because I find um, it can be quite invasive and it's already tricky enough um, stalking and sneaking up on an insect. If you also have to set up a second tripod behind it, another flash on that tripod, it just becomes very complicated. So it's a great technique if you're working with plants on your own. But um, I found that when I'm working with um, insects, I prefer using um, an assistant. So in this case, um, my partner 
um, didn't know he was volunteering himself um, all summer long to be going in the meadow with me, but he did. And what he'll do is I will position myself in front of the, the insect. Um, I'll focus on the insect and when I'm ready, he will slowly put the background behind it um, and then position the flash just behind that. And that allows me to be able to say to him, oh, I need the background a bit lower or a bit more to the left, which if I'd set up the plamp, then you, know, you can't move it once it's set up. So they're just things to think about and how best you want to do it. And then I've put, oh, you wanted to say something, Linda, sorry. Yeah, I, before you go on, I was yeah. afraid that you were gonna flip your, your um, slide. Someone asked and then he figured it out, but for the benefit of everyone, because I don't know what it is, what is Perspex? That white sheet of Perspex, what is so that? white sheet of Perspex is like um, a white sheet of um, translucent uh, plastic. Okay. So that just allows the light to travel through. Um, so when you put the flash behind it, it'll light up that background. So okay. instead of having like a solid bit of plastic where the light doesn't travel, it just lights it up. Okay. Thank you. I hope that's answered the question. <laughs> I think so. I wasn't sure if that was a brand name or if that was because I don't do this kind of shooting. So maybe everybody else knows what it is and I don't, but um, I wanted to at least ask about it. Thank you. Of course. No, that's fine. Um, the last thing I have on that list is um, outdoor clothes. And it seems like a basic kind of thing to say, but um, I went out shooting a lot and I went with my partner and we were in a field for lots of hours. When we came out of it, we noticed that he had um, ticks on his legs and ticks can hold um, Lyme disease. And if you're not careful, if it's not caught in time, that is a very serious disease to have. So outdoors clothes, if you go in an environment where you know there are ticks or some other insects that can be harmful to you, wearing you know, long trousers is a simple solution. And even you know, when you know, it's been very hot out in the South of France, I've gone out in um, shorts and then I have to put my knees down in the mud and there are brambles or things like that. It's just, it's good to think about wearing either like long trousers or taking um, something people forget about, taking um, a little cushion or a foldable cushion that you can then just put out and that will save your knees a lot. <laughs> so that's kind of like the essential kit you're gonna want to have. But again, you can play around with it. So here's kind of an example of a makeshift setup that I made. So I had a ladybird landed on my background and I thought, great, I'm on my own. How am I going to do this? I grabbed two chairs, placed a piece of Perspex in between them. And as you can see, I put one of the flashes underneath. I had the flash with the diffuser on top. And then you can position yourself either side on or from above. Um, and then all you have to do is focus. And obviously once the insect's left, it's left. But that was really to show that you can make any setup. The essentials are just having those two flashes um, set up properly. And that allowed me to photograph this Harlequin ladybird as it made its exit from my background. <laughs> so what subjects um, should you start with? So I would always recommend to keep it simple. You know, you're just starting off, you're getting used to the equipment. Um, start with plants you know um, if you want to get the best ones i choose plants that are isolated because that way you're going to be able to uh, move around them and really practice your setup and what works for you um, a mistake i made don't start with a white plant because you're already going to be fighting with the flash intensity is it too bright is it not bright enough when you use a white when you photograph a white plant if you're, if you're not used to um, setting your flashes, it's just gonna be completely overexposed and you're just gonna have a white image. So I wouldn't start with that. Choose a day where there's little to no wind. Wind is, in my opinion, gonna be um, your one, number one enemy. The minute there's wind, the plants are moving around and it's just really hard to focus 
on um, your subject. So when you're starting off, please just choose a day where it's not windy because otherwise you're gonna think this is impossible, I can't ever do this. And that's not true. You can do this. Um, and just make sure you can see all the details in your images, you know, practice um, that balance in the flash, but practice focusing. Um, a lot of people haven't used um, a macro lens before and it has a short depth of field. So you're going to want to, when I started off, using a macro lens, I'd um, try and focus uh, kind of manually. And then when I was close, you sort of want to hold your camera and just lean back and forth until you get um, the image in focus. And that's how I'm able to show the spider. I don't know if you can see on your screens, there's a spider at the top of the plant. And that little detail wouldn't be possible if um, it was out of focus or blurry. When you feel um, more confident with the setup, you know, it, it's like baby steps, you know, try um, taking pictures of images, sorry, of animals that are notorious for being slow, you know, like snails or slugs. They're not going to make a run for it straight away. Again, keep their well-being um, as a priority. Don't keep them for long. But it's going to allow you to practice on a slightly moving subject. And it's also going to test you um, on how you're going to position your flashes and yourself because um, slugs, for example, are very reflective. So it's just going to be good practice for you to um, try that. And then, you know, move on to slightly faster animals progressively when you're feeling more comfortable with the setup. So this is um, the caterpillar of the hummingbird hawk moth. Now I was unable as far to photograph the hummingbird hawk moth because it doesn't stop to rest. Um, it's extremely active. But I got lucky one day when I came across um, its caterpillar. And I thought it was actually quite nice to be able to capture um, the animal's elegance and its natural beauty. Um, and as you can see here, the white plants, you really have to get that balance right, otherwise they will disappear into your background. Um, so those are just things you want to think about. And then you're gonna build up your confidence with the technique and that's gonna allow you to move on to trickier subjects. So with this, um, these five spot burn it moths, um, you know, you start by stalking them and then you get closer to them, you slowly position yourself and that's going to allow you to really move from taking pictures of plants to taking pictures of insects on their own to be able to capture um, animal behavior. And that's where you can start, you know, testing yourself and your skills. Something that I'd recommend doing that I think is sometimes overlooked is to analyze your environment. So a lot of the time um, I'll grab my friends and I'll tell them to <laughs> just stare at a field. That's it, just look at it. Because when you're walking past it, it looks empty. It doesn't look like there's anything there. But actually, if you spend a minute or two just looking, you're gonna see that field come to life. You're gonna see movement everywhere and then you're gonna start you know, seeing, oh, that's a bee or oh, there's a grasshopper. So I would recommend when you're starting off in the environment you've chosen, whether it's your garden, a nearby meadow, a field, go there without your camera. And I know that's a bit of a contradiction because, you know, my first instinct is, oh, I'm discovering somewhere new, I'm going to take pictures everywhere. But actually, when you're starting off and you want to kind of get used to that habitat, you should go there and just observe because there's no there's no secret to finding the insects or the animals. It's just taking the time um, to see what's there and discovering what's there. Um, and it's always a pleasure, you know, to discover new species, you know. Um, and that's actually how I came across this spotted fertility caterpillar. Now, when I took this image, I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. 
I'd seen it a few times in some walks and I finally decided, right, I'm going to take a picture of it because it's not moved. I don't know what's happening. And, you know, caterpillars don't tend to do this. <laughs> so I looked it up and I found out that actually this was the work of a parasitic wasp. Now, what parasitic wasps will do, not all of them, but certain ones will lay their eggs, and I'm sorry about this, but they will lay their eggs inside of other animals, and in this case, this caterpillar, and then um, the eggs will hatch and they will eat their way from the inside of the caterpillar out. And I actually, by taking this image, I discovered a mystery that I hadn't realized that was happening in the meadow because I was seeing all these dead caterpillars around and I couldn't work out what was happening. And this was the key to it. Parasitic wasps were laying their eggs in all the caterpillars. And if I hadn't taken the time to, you know, look at the environment and seeing what was happening, I wouldn't have ever discovered this. And, you know, just by taking the time, you're going to discover a lot more than you thought you would. What you don't want to forget are the principles of this technique. The movement was created to help people connect with their local wildlife. And what better way to do so than to research the species you're finding? You know, it's great to photograph them and get a beautiful image, but the meaning behind it is what you find out about those insects or those animals or even the plants. Um, so on the left hand side, you have the bloody nose beetle larva, which I mistook at first for a tick, but it's actually the larva of the beetle. And on the right is the bloody nose beetle. So I looked into why we call it a bloody nose beetle. And actually it's because of um, a defense mechanism. So when the uh, bloody nose beetle feels threatened, it will produce a red liquid that then the predator will taste. And when the predator tastes that liquid, it has a foul taste. And that's their way of getting a predator not to eat them. Because once it's tasted that foul flavor, it thinks that the beetle is gonna taste the same. So it decides not to attack it. And to us, when it produces this red liquid, it looks like it has a bloody nose and that's where it gets its name from. So it's fun, you know, little things like that, that will help also other people connect to the wildlife. You know, when you have a story, people are interested and they want to know more. I also came across um, this grasshopper nymph with everfrism. And what that is, is um, kind of rare condition that happens um, in insects where they have an excess amount of uh, red or pink pigmentation. Um, and that's why this grasshopper looks pink. And I didn't know that. I thought, you know, we have such diverse animals. I thought that this was just, you know, this is just a pink grasshopper. You know, that's normal. I'll, I'll photograph it because it looks amazing. But then whilst doing my research, I realized that no, this is actually a rare condition that not many people get to see. So I was actually quite privileged in finding it. And again, it just shows you the beauty and diversity of your local wildlife. You don't have to travel you know, across the world to be able to find something amazing and something that people haven't necessarily seen a lot. Here we have the Napoleon spider. So I originally photographed a Napoleon spider because I wanted to capture its feeding habits as you can see it here, um, eating a hoverfly. And of course, uh, being part French, I had to wonder why it was called Napoleon spider. And I found out that it was because if you tilt your head a certain way and you look at the abdomen, the abdomen looks like the silhouette of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. So it looks like his hat. And again, I thought that was incredible how you can find uh, patterns in wildlife. Um, I've seen it before on a uh, shield bug where actually when I looked at it, I could see um, a pharaoh's head. So again, it's things like that that once people see, it stays in their mind and they connect with it. So doing your research is extremely important. 
And then my final example here is the assassin bug. Now, I really like the assassin bug because of how deadly it is to other predators. You know, it's already red, which is important to highlight with the meet your neighbors technique because to predators, red uh, colors in insects is kind of a warning sign, like be cautious. So some predators won't attack it based on its color. But um, for those who don't know, the assassin bug uses its proboscis to um, stab its prey. It then lets out um, um, a venomous saliva that will liquefy the insides of its prey. And then it will slurp up those insides like a smoothie and then leave the carcass there to rot. And that's personally something I'd never heard of. So that has stuck with me ever since. Um, and a fun story about that is um, my mum wanted to come out with me one day uh, on one of my shoots and see, you know, what I do and how I do it. And we came across an assassin bug and she was helping me out. And she said, hey, you know, um, is this bug dangerous to humans? You know, should, should I be keeping my distance? Now, some of you might know that as a photographer, your only headset is, I need this image. Like, I need to be able to show this to others. So in the moment, I hadn't done my research and I just looked at my mom and I'm like, I'm sure it's fine. Don't you worry. So she helped me out on the shoot. And afterwards, I looked up if the assassin bug could be at all dangerous to humans. Um, I firstly found out it could produce um, an itchy allergic reaction. And then I found that it could also carry some serious diseases. So when I told my mum, she wasn't the happiest, but she's forgiven me now and she still does come out on some of my shoots. But that's also, you know, something just to think about uh, when you're approaching some of these animals that they're not always the friendliest if provoked. So some research tools you can use. I'm going to recommend obviously wildlife books of your local area. You know, there's nothing better than um, looking up what you can find already in your area. Um, and you can pick this up, you know, secondhand shops, Amazon, you know, even the kit I've talked about, the flashes, you know, you can buy those um, on Amazon. You don't have to spend hundreds of thousands on the equipment. Uh, conservation websites. So here in England, we have Butterfly Conservation, for example, and they have a little tab that allows you to um, identify a butterfly based on the location you took the image, the size and the color. And I think there are some more criteria, but those are the main ones I use. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be those same resources um, in the States or anywhere else you are. And then one I thought about a few years ago was actually Facebook groups. And I hadn't thought of that before, but you know, I'd photographed some spiders and some other insects that I just wasn't finding in books or on conservation websites. Um, and you can find groups like um, spiders of England or probably you know, bumblebees of California. And as long as those groups say you can post images, there's nothing stopping you from posting an image and saying, hi, everyone, I tried to look up um, this bumblebee. I'm not sure what it is, or I'm thinking it could be this or this. And then you'll see people um, comment underneath. Now, what I recommend is don't take it face value. You know, don't go, oh, that person said it was a red tailed bumblebee. That's what it is. Do your own research afterwards. But what is going to help you is guide you in the right direction. And a lot of times, people are right. People, you know, they know their subjects, they're passionate about it. So they're gonna know what you're dealing with, but just check it because, you know, everyone makes mistakes, uh, but that's just gonna help you that get that much closer. There are gonna be different strategies for approaching different insects. So some insects are extremely active during the day and therefore they're going to be hard to photograph. 
I decide to take the time to look at the environment over a couple of weeks um, at different times of day. And that's very important because this allowed me to observe um, different behaviors. I spotted this wall carder bee on one of my walks. It was the beginning of the day, the sun was starting to rise uh, and some of them were resting on the plant. And it was honestly a surreal experience because I was out um, looking for butterflies and then I just came across branches and branches of these European wall carver bees. And I couldn't believe it. They were just all there, not moving at all, just resting. And I couldn't believe my luck. And I just, you know, I photographed as many as I could, as you do, without disturbing them. Again, you know, they're resting, so they're not moving. You can place your background behind, you know, or you can get your assistant hold background and then the flash and you position yourself in front. And as long as you don't disturb them too much, you know, by the time you're gone, they're still resting there. And I noticed that butterflies were tired at the end of the day. And what this knowledge is going to do is it's going to allow you to plan your shoots and avoid disappointment. So you're going to manage your time better when you know what time of day the animals you're looking for are active or are resting. And a little note I would like to make on this also is that if you're wanting to identify um, butterflies, it's gonna be much better if you um, photograph the inner and outer wings because, so I've put it's a fertility butterfly because I'm unable to see the exact markings on the side. So I can't say with certainty um, which one it is but I managed to creep up on it slowly enough to be able to photograph its antenna um, and its facial features and just get that front uh, facing image. So, you know, I compromised on knowing what it was, but I got the image I was looking for. There are going to be um, some issues you're going to have to overcome. So my biggest one I'd say was heat stroke. So um, I was looking, it was in the late 30s and um, 30 degrees Celsius. So that was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe. So it's very hot. And every time I'd go out, um, I just get heat stroke. And then that would put me out for the next day. And I really tried um, everything. I tried umbrellas and one day I was out on the shoot and I forgot to wear a cap um, and all I had with me was um, a cushion that I bought to be able to um, put my knees down on and I took that cushion and I put it on my head and I looked like um, a crazy person in a field with a cushion on my head but I avoided having heat strike. Um, something else you're going to want to do is or be aware of is that your flash being too strong. Um, so when your flash is too strong, um, you're gonna have an overexposed image. Um, and when that happens, you're gonna lose information um, on your image. And same, you know, the opposite, if your flash isn't strong enough, um, you're not going to be able um, to see anything. So getting that balance right is going to be crucial to this technique. Forgetting to charge your kit. Now, you're going to need batteries um, for your flashes, if they're like mine. And taking extra batteries whilst you're out and about is going to be essential. Um, and I have been out before and forgotten to charge my camera. I've come across the most amazing insect, set up the whole kit and then just realized my camera had no battery left from the day before. So if that's happened to you and you're like me, I would suggest um, investing in a second battery because that is going to um, just change your life. And it means that if you're out on the shoot and your battery dies, you have the other one ready um, in your uh, backpack. Uh, be cautious of the wildlife um, around you. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, with the ticks, but also um, 
some wildlife is going to try and bite you, some is going to try and sting you. But my experience on the whole is that as long as you don't go and disturb it, and as long as we have snakes in the meadow, and I'm terrified of snakes, but you know, as long as I kept my distance and you know, I watched where I was walking, I had no issues at all. I've mentioned the wind again because to me that was just the biggest thing that was creating havoc in my shoots. When you're really trying to focus, there's this butterfly that's resting, you've been looking for it for ages and it's just moving back and forth nonstop and you're trying to get that crisp image and it's just not working out for you. Patience. You're going to need a lot of patience. You're going to have to observe your environment. You're going to have to approach the insect slowly and then be able to photograph them. But honestly, stay motivated. You know, what keeps me motivated is the fact that every time I go out, I'll find something different or I'll find something that was always there that I hadn't noticed. And I see a bit like bird watching. So you know how bird watchers will have their little books and they'll either tick off which bird they've seen or they'll write down uh, which they've seen that day. I kind of do the same thing with my images, but for like insects, you know, I'll be like, oh, this time I saw a common blue damselfly and it'll be my own kind of insect watchers list. And that's something that really inspires me and keeps me going. So I just wanted to give you um, an example of what I was saying when your flash can be too strong. So, these, believe it or not, are images that were taken like five minutes apart. The image on the left, my flash was on too strong and I just lost all the details um, in this grasshopper. And like I mentioned, you've lost so much information there that coming back from that is going to be really hard in post-production. You know, you're already putting yourself at a disadvantage. Whereas the image on the right, now don't get me wrong, the image on the right has been edited, but it hasn't been, you know, I haven't had to come back from an image like on the left. You know, I was already working on um, some strong, you know, strong colors, strong lighting, and it was, it was much easier to edit. So this is just something you want to think about when you're out in the field and you're trying to get an image, take that time to adjust your flash because that post-production time is gonna be doubled and you will be disappointed if you haven't taken the time to get that balance right. Um, another um, one I wanted to highlight is when on the left, you have the background lit up. So the flash has gone off on that background. It's lit up, but my flash for some reason or another hasn't gone off in the front either. The battery's died. I've forgotten to turn it on, which has happened. You know, when you see something all of a sudden, you set up your, quick with your kit really quickly, and you just forget to switch one little button or you, you know, things like that. But for whatever reason, it didn't go off. But I just wanted to show you what it looks like um, if you only use a flash on the background and not on the subject. And in contrast, on the right, um, the background hasn't been lit up, but the subject has. So it kind of shows you why you need to balance both out. And then the end result will be an image like this one where, um, funnily enough, I didn't think about focusing on a particular insect. I noticed that um, this bee or lots of bees were flying in and out of um, these lilies. And I thought, if I want to catch one in flight and photograph it, I'm going to need to um, focus on the lily itself, be extremely patient and wait for the perfect moment where that bee is going to fly back out of that flower. So that's also, you know, something else to think about. There are no rules on what you need to focus on or where, what time or anything like that. So you can really play around a bit. If you see something that's interesting, you know, go for it, set it up, try it. You might be the first, you never know. I do want to talk about post-production a bit because I can understand that it can be, if you haven't done it before, it can be um, quite nerve wracking. 
So I use um, Photoshop. That's my go to personally. And I used to believe when I started off photography, I used to believe that post production was unnecessary and that um, I was altering the truth. And then over time, I realized that I wasn't actually changing the narrative of the image. I was just enhancing its natural beauty. And I noticed that the images I were taking uh, were slightly less saturated once um, they came off my camera than what I was seeing in real life. And that's because a camera can't capture the spectrum of colors that we can see. So in post-production, um, I give the wildlife back its vibrancy. You know, I'm not going crazy. I'm not, you know, putting all of the vibrant colors that I can. I'm just upping it a bit so that people can see what I see. And I'll show you an example in a minute of that. With the meet your neighbors technique, you might have, you know, when you're positioning yourself, you might have some strands of grass that are going to pop up in an image that when you're trying to photograph um, a beetle or something like that, um, that might disappear or run off if you try and move that little strand of grass away. You're just going to, you know, take the image and then I make the choice in some cases in post-production to what I call simplify my images. And again, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. And then I edit my white backgrounds so that each image side by side will have the same white background. So I'm going to show you what I mean. Here is an image of um, a kooky wasp. Now, firstly, the background, I don't know. Again, everyone's monitor is going to be different, so you might not see exactly what I mean. But the two backgrounds um, are slightly different white. So the one on the left is going to be sort of more grayish, and the one on the right is going to be what I call more um, pure white. Um, so that's what I mean. I will level it out so that each one of my backgrounds, if I put them side by side, look the same. Um, you can also tell that the, just so you know, this is the same image. These are not two different images. These are the same images. But I'm just showing you what kind of edit I've done. So with the um, Kooky Wasp on the left, you can see it's a lot less vibrant than the one on the right. And again, I haven't gone crazy on how vibrant I've made this insect. This, these are the colors I saw when I was taking the image. And I find it, it's important to be able to show people how beautiful um, these animals can be. And then that leads me to when I talked about simplifying the images. So you can probably see this cuckoo wasp to here, you know, it looks quite big. Um, in real life, it's about 1.2 centimeters, which is about 0 0.5 inches in length. So it's a tiny animal. Um, so when you have all those extra branches, I find that actually that takes away, you know, your sort of look away from the cuckoo wasp. So I took them out because they're not changing the narrative. It's not all of a sudden a different plant. It just means that now you are focusing on the cuckoo wasp a lot more and your attention is drawn to it. And that's you know, why I make these images and why I take these photographs is to show their natural beauty and highlight their importance as much as I can. So you're now all pros. You've now mastered the technique. You know, um, you've got, you've managed to photograph a European mantis. It's looking at you. It's in focus, the colors are right. Where do you go from here? You know, you, you've been taking great images. How do you progress with the technique? You can start by focusing on the composition. So with this male um, rhinoceros beetle, um, compared to the female, it has this really impressive horn. Now, I really wanted to show that off, so I decided to position myself um, lower, slightly lower than the beetle, so this horn looks much bigger and more impressive. So that's what I did. But also I thought about um, the composition, you know, whilst photograph it whilst it's moving. 
um, capturing all those different textures. You know, you have the hairs on the beetle, you have the moss, you have the bark, the lichen, um, and then you have all um, the colors that kind of work in harmony. You have the browns, the reds, um, the greens, and to me, that kind of reminds me a bit of autumn, you know, and obviously, you can't just pick up the beetle and put it wherever you want. You know, it has to make sense of where it was. But you can think, right, it's moving this way. I think this would be a good framing for it. Or I want to photograph it face on. You know, you, you want to start thinking of what you've nailed the setup. You want to start thinking about what story you want this image to have and how you're going to portray that to other people. You can decide to start documenting your marine wildlife. Um, so I don't know um, how many of you go rock pooling, but when you um, go rock pooling or when I go rock pooling, I'll use a net, you know, I'll sort of fish in a rock pool and then I'll put what I find in a bucket full of seawater. And usually, you know, that's how you sort of show children also what they can find. You know, it's a great way to kind of connect with that wildlife. But actually, if you make a slight change and instead of putting it into a bucket, you put it into, I use um, a glass Tupperware that I fill with seawater. Now, again, that's very important that you use seawater and not filtered water or tap water because then you are going to endanger the species. But if you put it into um, a glass Tupperware of some water, underneath that, you're gonna put your white background like usual. Under that, you're going to have your flash pointing upwards. Above it, you're going to have your other flash. And then you can position yourself above too. And then you'll have um, this view. Now, something to note when you're taking pictures of marine wildlife is because you are using um, seawater, there are going to be particles and there are going to be sands sometimes in the image. So you just want to think about that because it does mean you're going to have a bit more post-production work to do on your image to take those out. If you want to challenge yourself, you can try and photograph different stages of a life cycle. So I did this with um, the spotted fritillary. So I managed to photograph the caterpillar um, and the butterflies. But if you want to go one step further, you know, look for the eggs, get the caterpillar, um, find the pupa, and then find the butterflies, you know, and then put all that together into um, one big image. And that can really also be impactful to people when they see it and they see each stage. Um, and then that also will get you to um, think about the plants more. You know, if once you start looking for a certain caterpillar, you're gonna look up what that caterpillar feeds on. And you're just going to get to know, you know, your local wildlife a lot more. And then once you've done that, you can start focusing also on other animals like, you know, ladybirds, anything you can find, you know, try and photograph, eat different stage of it. You can also um, recreate your local landscape. I did show in this presentation um, an image of the meadow uh, where I was working. Um, and you can also photograph, what I've done is I photographed each plant individually and then a kind of collage of the plants. And what I call this a kind of meet your neighbor's landscape. Um, and what I find is that with this, I'm kind of, um, paying homage to each individual plant and its importance um, in the ecosystem, in the whole, you know, because it's easy to focus on the animals and the insects, but actually, you know, the plants play a crucial role in all of that too. And as I mentioned just before, you know, once you start researching um, the plants, you'll then know oh, that's that plant and I can see this kind of caterpillar here during this time of year. And you'll just get to know everything um, much simpler. And again, you'll reconnect with your wildlife. And once you've done that once, you can do it again. 
you know, the first one was of um, the meadow. And this one is a small landscape I made of um, my garden. You know, um, you can work on the movement of the plants. You can work on what colors work best with which ones. And then you can also add insects. And I feel like that's taking um, the meet your neighbors technique to a different level. You know, you've now, you've got that image of the insect on its own and some of those images will work perfectly as standalones. And then some of them will just have a new meaning once you add them all together. And that is usually done in post-production. And again, this kind of shows the importance of having the same white background across all the images, because if they weren't the same, this is the moment you'd see it. To kind of finish things off, I'd just like to show um, this book I made uh, called Our Hidden Neighbors. And it showcases um, the wildlife I photographed over the two years in the Southwest of France, in my garden and in the meadow. Now, the reason I mentioned this and I mentioned this project is because um, the meadow that I've been talking about this whole time um, has had um, cars drive through it, it's had motorbikes on it, and that's just been devastating the landscape and obviously destroying the habitat of all the animals I've shown you. And even ones I haven't, you know, there are some birds that lay there, um, create their nests um, in the meadow, you know, near the floor. And the minute, you know, you, you destroy that, you're destroying everything that's there. So I wrote to my local town hall and um, I included images of some of the insects that I'd photographed saying, is there anything that we can do to protect um, the meadow because it's being devastated and we need to protect what we have? And after some exchanges, um, they got back to me saying, why don't we collaborate and create um, a signpost? Uh, for this signpost, we can use some of the images you've taken um, to educate people on the wildlife that they can find here in the meadow and why they need to be careful and what they can see. And they also said, we can also make a sign that bans uh, motorized vehicles on the meadow. And this is for me, this was the high point of the project. You know, this is why I've been doing this work. You know, I want to raise awareness. I want to showcase all the wonders that you can find. And just having that meant the world to me. And it was kind of why I did this project. And to be honest, I don't know if I, if I hadn't included the images, I don't know if it would have impacted um, the people who saw the email as much. So that's why I did this project and that's why I started it. And that's why it's so important to me. And I want to encourage others, you know, to give it a go, you know, go see what you can find. Um, and I would encourage you to, once you've started the technique, go to my website or my Instagram and contact me, show me what you've discovered, you know, um, encourage um, children and adults alike to care about their local wildlife. And I guess the last thing I have to say is um, go out and meet your neighbors. Katie, you did so good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so there are a lot of nice comments and I'll make sure that you get a copy of the chat in here. Um, you. Uh, you know, I think the most impactful thing that you said to me was that how you ended your images and you took the time to go to your local city government um, council. I'm not really sure um, what exactly um, that is, but you took the time to do that and said, look, this is, this is what's here. And they're not, I, I just, I really, I'm just so impressed that they 
took the time to listen to you and came back and said, hey, this is what we can do. And that that collaboration has got to make you so, so proud because you, as there are many messages in here, um, you made a difference. And, and that is just really, really commendable. So congratulations on that. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. So I'm going to get you to take down the uh, yep. your screen. Stop sharing your screen, and I'm going to hit you with a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, Mika it. is wondering, she says, do you ever use the high key technique versus putting the white background behind the subject? Can I ask her what she means by that? So the, uh, the, what we call high key is basically shooting really, really high ISO. So you get that white natural, I mean, it's, 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 right, right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're calling high key vert. I personally don't because I, I think it might be hard to then balance uh, with your subject getting that lighting right, and it's already quite hard when you're using the flashes because you're going to try and adjust that intensity. But also on days where it's sunny that intensity is going to be different on days where it's cloudy. Again, it's going to be different and you're always just going to be juggling that. And personally, I just find it easier to put that white background because if my flash does fail for any reason, it does fail and it doesn't light up or it doesn't light up as strong as I'd like it to, I still have that white background. So I can still kind of work with it in post-production, but if I don't have anything there, it's just, I think it's going to be a lot more work. Okay. So um, Susan has a question in here. So let me see if I can, I'm going to read it as it is. And maybe, maybe you'll understand what she's asking. She's wanting to know, have you ever shot without the second flash behind the background? And she is having a little trouble imagining how that works. Okay. Um, so I have personally, um, I mean, I've unwillingly shot without the flash behind my other background because it has either died on me or run out of batteries. Um, and the difference that makes is the issue you're going to have is if you have your subject lit up and not your background. In post-production, yeah, you can do, you know, like a color select where you select the color white and you can change um, the exposure on that. However, if you're animal, plant, anything has even the slightest bit of white in it, that too is going to shoot up. And that just makes for a lot more post-production work than you really, you know, everyone wants to be out shooting. No one wants to be really behind the computer editing for hours and hours. Yeah. Um, uh, but let me, let me throw a softball question at you while Susan comes in and types. Um, Vernon was curious, what are your usual camera settings? Do you mind sharing those? I mean, <laughs> honestly, it changes all the time. Um, you're not going to want to go with the flashes. You won't want to go over one 250th of a second because then it's going to be too fast with the flash and you're going to get this big black stripe across mm -hmm. your image. Um, the depth of field, again, it'll depend on um, the light intensity because you can adjust it with that too. So it's going to kind of change with that. You do want kind of, if you can aim for around 11, that's usually quite a good um, depth of field because you want to see as much oh, of the yeah. insect or plant as possible. Um, and then I guess the flash intensity, like I mentioned, it just, it honestly, it varies. If it's a sunny day, like I said, it, you know, you're going to turn it down. If it's cloudy day, you're going to turn it up. And it's just, honestly, like, I've mentioned before, it's a lot of trial and error, but once you get used to it and once you have the hang of it, it gets much easier. Okay. Um, Susan did come back and her question is, it's not so much a question, but she can't envision how the flashes connect to each other. Right. Um, so I maybe should have been more clear about it. Um, I have um, a receiver on my camera and that receiver is linked to, I'm not sure what they're called, but there are two other receivers on the flashes, if that makes sense. And they'll sort of attach onto it so that when you trigger um, your camera shutter and take an image, that sends the information to the flashes that they need to now 
you know, go off as you're taking the image and they all work together. And that's how they all connect. I hope that's a bit clearer and I hope that's answered your question, Susan. I don't, I don't know. I don't use Flash, so I, I can't help you either, Susan, but I do know that we had a presentation on Flashes, so I will send that to you um, separately to, to go back and look at that. Um, I don't see anything else in this present uh, in the chat on questions. There's a lot of nice comments. And Katie, um, I, I had to laugh because there's one in here because uh, I, I think we said this is your first presentation. And Valerie says, there's no way this is her first presentation <laughs> because you did so, so well. So like I mentioned, this is such an important um, cause in a sense. And I really do want to encourage others to use this technique. Yeah. Um, so I've been, you know, practicing on how best to get that message across and how best to um, explain it to everyone. So I'm glad that everyone's understood and liked it. Well, you did, you did great. Um, so with that, I'm going to close out your session and thank you so very much for coming and do the, doing this because I know it's, it is way past midnight, your time. And uh, that, that's, that's commendable right there. All <laughs> right. <you guys. laughs> um, Katie, thank you very much. Um, thank you. You guys can connect with Katie through her website katiewaddingtonphotography.com and on Instagram she's at Katie Waddington Photography. That's Katie underscore Waddington underscore photography. And I'm going to link all of those uh, all of her social links in um, the at the bottom of the video. So next week Carol Highsmith will be here to present for the ages. Carol has been documenting America for her collection at the Library of Congress for over 40 years. She's the only living person in the featured digital collection at the Library of Congress. And I can assure you that she'll have many stories to share with us. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon. <music>